My name is Dario Hasenstab. I have two degrees in international affairs, and I'm here with Balder Hagritz, a former university professor of mine, as well as an IR consultant. And together, we're bursting the Western bubble. Today, we will analyze how to understand the Israel-Hamas conflict through the lens of the Western bubble. Because while Western societies have many strengths and significant weaknesses, in order to analyze these, we use the concept of the Western bubble. If you would like to know more about this concept, how this podcast started, or who we are, make sure to listen to our introduction episode. Hi, Balder. Why are we speaking about this topic today? And let's be honest, why are we speaking about this topic again, as we already spoke about uh, the Israel-Hamas conflict last week? Hello, Dario. Well, that's a fair question. And there is an argument to be made that we shouldn't, because the past week has seen millions of hours being recorded on YouTube, TikTok, and podcasts, and even more articles written in newspapers about this conflict. And so... Hopefully, we'll still be able to contribute something valuable and original. But the fact is that uh, since last week, since we recorded, there has been enormous bloodshed, human suffering, and also plainly bad policymaking. There has been a lot of Western bubble thinking surrounding the violence between the state of Israel and Hamas. And this is worth exploring, not just because we care about human well-being, but also because it is a very good case study of how bad policy can lead to very destructive outcomes and it's worth spending another episode on. And what are the facts? The ongoing military conflict between Israel and uh, and Hamas escalated last week when militant groups led by Hamas attacked Israel on the 7th of October with a rocket barrage of at least 3,000 rockets. In parallel, approximately 2,500 Palestinian militants breached the Gaza-Israeli barrier, attacking military bases and massacring civilians in neighboring Israeli communities. At least 1,400 Israelis were killed that day, and approximately 150 have been kidnapped. The surprise attack was met with Israeli retaliatory strikes, and Israel formally declared war on Hamas. The airstrikes have killed 2,750 Palestinians as of October 15th, with around 10,000 people injured and hundreds of thousands fleeing northern Gaza. What is the bubble? When we talk about the bubble, um, let's start with a bit of terminology, simply because this is, especially with conflicts where a lot of people are expressing their opinions and analysis, a lot of terms get yeah, conflated. Um, and actually, there was one in the in the fact sheet, which I thought was an interesting formulation that I took from a source, where it simply said that Israel declared war on Hamas. Um, right? That's it's uh, this makes about as much sense as declaring the war on terror. Yeah, absolutely. It makes not or the war on drugs or all, any kind of thing. You cannot declare formally declare war on Hamas because it's not a Westphalian state. So typically, and anyone can look this up on, on Google, if you look for the definition of war, it's either between two Westphalian entities or it's a civil war within a country. Neither of these applies to this conflict. From an Israeli perspective, and I'm not necessarily labeling them as such because it's a bit more nuanced, but... Uh, if you think of Hamas as like a criminal organization, uh, you cannot declare war on a criminal organization. You can f- fight them, you can try to kill them, you can um, arrest them, but you there you cannot declare war against a non-Westphalian organization like that. It just doesn't make sense from a terminology perspective. And also it provides the wrong kind of surrounding narrative about it. it it gives the idea that these are two armies or two sort of equally sized military groups battling it out which is simply not the case so because you could say that israel mm, declares war on palestine maybe however that's already you know one of the mistakes that many people make out there is that this is this conflating palestine palestinians with hamas which are separate things yeah, so even the, even if they were to say we declare war on Palestine, that would be a bit iffy because the Westphalian identity of Palestine is not clearly established. Yes, there is the observer status in the UN, but it's not very clear which territory, which lines are being included in that. Who is the representative? Is it uh, Fatah? Is it Abbas? Is it who? who and on, on what grounds rep- do they represent the Palestinian people? So even... A, a war declaration against Palestine would be iffy, 
but um, certainly against a group like Hamas, which has no formal population it represents, and it has no formal territory it occupies or holds, simply does not make sense. And it only helps to push the narrative that Israel somehow is in an existential conflict, that it is being invaded. And there was a terrorist uh, weekend, if you like, a, a weekend full of terrorist deeds of murder and kidnapping and destruction by Hamas. But this was not an attempt by Hamas to occupy Israeli territory because Hamas is not a territorial entity. Uh, they, for a short period of time, they occupied a, a bit of territory in Israel, but never with the idea of controlling that territory. So this kind of terminology only helps with the idea of making it bigger and broader than it really is. And this also goes back to the idea that we are talking about an existential struggle on, on, on let's say, on the Israeli side, right? On this ongoing conflict from 70 to 80 years ago. But that's no longer the case. I mean, this is something we've, we've expressed uh, multiple times in, in last week's episode. The, Israel has won. It, the, now we're just talking about, okay, how are we going to deal with this situation where one, one party has won and the other party is suffering a lot? And this is so important. So if you go back in time and you look at Israel, the geopolitical position of Israel in, let's say, the 1960s or 1950s, even though the state of Palestine at that moment doesn't exist in any Westphalian entity, you could argue that Israel still has a territorial conflict because you have the original UN plan and the borders of Palestine versus Israel. You have an Arab world that is existentially threatening Israel. Um, you could absolutely argue from an Israeli perspective in the 60s that you are fighting for survival. And you could even argue that the Palestinians are your biggest rival, that the Palestinians are at least geopolitically your, your biggest problem. Now, in reality, it was the Arab world that puts pressure on Israel, Egypt, uh, Syria, other, other nations that were the, that were the enemy. But you could, you could make a case there. But essentially, since 1978, since the Camp David Accords of 1978 in Egypt recognizing Israeli the Israeli existence and signing a peace agreement. Since then, Israel has won this conflict and there is no longer any existential threat to Israel. Again, I would like to emphasize, obviously, that doesn't mean that Israelis can't be killed, as we've seen in this past week. Obviously, there's always uh, terrorist groups or groups that can murder Israelis, just like there could be a terrorist group killing people in Switzerland. That is always an op a possibility. And that is worth defending against that is worth worrying about if you're the state of Israel. But the existential conflict is done and people don't seem to realize that. So this conflation, exactly as you said, between on the one hand Palestine and Hamas or the Palestinians and Hamas, as if Hamas somehow equates to Palestinians. And on the other hand, this idea of Israel declaring war against an 80-year-old enemy uh, because Israel is fighting for survival creates a completely false narrative with bad analysis and bad policy solutions, right? Because it then suggests that calling 30, uh, 350,000 reservists and um, s um, creating this huge military operation to strike back makes sense. Whereas in reality, it doesn't make any sense. It only exacerbates the problem that Israel is facing. And based on this false narrative or... Yeah, mistaken narrative. There's three different groups out there now, you know, reacting to this, because obviously we're talking about a region where I think a total of 12 million people are, you know, living in that little territory. But this is a very emotional topic. So the rest of the world is obviously going, going, you know, 100% in. And there's about three major groups, I think, that we can identify um, that are going into either direction. So there's the ones that fully support Israel. Then there's the ones who kind of say, mm, this is more, hey, let's defend Palestine, Palestine and Palestinians here. You know, nobody likes Hamas, but let's be honest, this is on Israel. And then there's a third group, people who say, we need peace. Um, and let's, let's start with the first group here. 
Um, I mean, I would I would count the West into this group, right? Uh, Israel, you have our full support. You were attacked. You now have, and I list, I hear this a lot. You now have the international law protected right to retaliate against them. Yeah, and it's here the uh, we should probably be more precise. And it's them saying this to the Israeli governments, the Israeli states, because within Israel there are plenty of voices that are actually concerned about this kind of thing, right? But it's essentially the West. Uh, let's say Israel, you know, we understand you do whatever you need to do and we've got your back and thereby exacerbating the problem once again. And what is interesting here is that those three categories that you just mentioned, and we'll start with analyzing uh, Israel, but not, none of those three categories feels comfortable with recognizing that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is over. So what we said just before, none of them likes that message, right? The Israelis don't like that message. Because it all of a sudden means that they have to scratch their head and start thinking about taking more responsibility and, and changing their approach to regional relations, specifically towards Palestinians. It's a very different psychology if you're Israel and you're in this existential fight. Or if you've won this existential fight and you're now responsible for creating a more peaceful environment you know the moment that you've won you kind of need to become generous but if israel has shown anything is that over the past 20 years it has become less generous towards the palestinians right so if you and i are all the time fighting and at some point you say i surrender at that moment it becomes my responsibility to say okay you've surrendered i've won i got what i wanted from the conflict i got the territory nobody you're not threatening me anymore now i'm going to try to be nice to you because we still have to coexist somehow Israel, of course, doesn't like that message because that puts a lot of emphasis and, and responsibility on their shoulders, and so they reject it. The Palestinians don't like the message because it means that they kind of have to stop fighting this unwinnable fight. So nobody likes hearing this message because it puts emphasis on these actors to start behaving in a different way. The Palestinians would have to give up uh, their unwinnable fight and, and try to kind of build something up from the rubble of the lost war, which obviously is uncomfortable because it's never easy to accept the loss of such an existential important conflict. And the Israelis need to do the opposite. They need to say, okay, now we are responsible as the winners. We can celebrate our victory, but with modesty, because we now have the Palestinians who are suffering their loss. And it also puts pressure on the rest of the world because the rest of the world all of a sudden would have to start saying, okay, so now there's no longer this existential war between two equal camps. How do we uh, actually aid the losers of this conflict? How do we actually put money on the table? And how do we put effort on the table to make sure that the Palestinian refugees are taken care of, that the displaced Palestinians are taken care of? So no party wants to hear it wants to face reality in, in this with this specific group right so with everyone who supports israel and fully supports them, right and it basically says yes we support you because you were attacked you have the right to defend yourselves which that isn't clearly defined either well i mean actually and here this is me with very little background in international law but the little background that i have says yes if you were attacked you're allowed to basically retaliate in equal measure um I believe that the equal measure has been exceeded. <laughs> it's uh, this, this is not me being a military expert, right? But I have a feeling, um, and it's it's right. And this this full support from this first group towards Israel is, I think, adding for or is creating space for Israel to exceed this measure. Um, and I think if we're if we're now talking about right, uh, particularly the West here, and also within the framework of the Western bubble. I think there's also a bit of a bias towards Israel simply because Israel is a democracy. And the number of times that I've heard European politicians this past week invoking that, as a democracy, they're entitled to defend themselves, uh, is incredibly frustrating. Because think about it for a moment. You're actually arguing that if you're a democracy, you're entitled to defend yourself in any way possible. If you're an author authoritarian regime, somehow you're not allowed to do that. So somehow there is something about being a democracy that allows you to use brutal tactics because of who you are. 
Whereas if you're an authoritarian regime, apparently you're not allowed to strike back because you're an authoritarian regime. That doesn't make any sense. This invoking of Israel as a democracy, therefore they have a right to defend themselves, is not just illogical, it is actually very damaging because we've seen over and over again that democracies can do terrible deeds. There is nothing inherently... Uh, pure about a democracy. Democracies can go into go into horrific wars. They can cause incredible destruction because a democracy is simply the will of the masses and the system doesn't at all guarantee good policy making, right? And yet that is kind of what's being suggested about Israel, right? Because they are a democracy, they will contain themselves. They will not do anything wrong. They will not cause any destruction. Well, ask, ask the Vietnamese how they felt about the war in Vietnam. Ask the Iraqis how they felt about the invasion of 2003. We've seen over and over again that democracies can err. Democracies can cause a lot of human suffering. And um, I really wish that Western politicians would stop using this label to justify Israeli policymaking. And so move, let's move on to the second group. Then you have the group who kind of supports, again, and this is difficult to say, right? Because, I, yeah, they kind of support Palestinians, right? Or Palestine. Again, this is not a clearly defined entity here. And then there will always be this, this kind of sense of, oh, um, nobody likes Hamas, right? What Hamas... What Hamas did, we don't like, but let's be honest, this wasn't Israel because, you know, Israel, and as, as, as you analyzed earlier, right, they're the winner. As the winner, they should be the ones taking care now and making sure that everyone is living fine. But it, it does have this whataboutism uh, to it. This, oh, yes, nobody likes Hamas, but this is on Israel. Yeah, and um, th this is this is a real problem because we are once again talking about groups and certainly among the Palestinians. And we, last week we talked about the Israelis and their background and the pain from which Israel was born, the Holocaust, but not just the Holocaust, but thousands of years of anti-Semitism. The collective pain of the Palestinians is, of course, significantly more recent in terms of loss of land, in terms of feeling of injustice, in terms of refugees, in terms of hardship, in terms of simply seeing children suffer because of horrible circumstances in both Gaza and the West Bank, uh, the, the frustration of seeing, if you like, your enemies, settlers settling in your land and then building uh, roads to even further divide your ancestral home. That collective pain is, of course, uh, leading to, if you like, emotional and irrational and tribal thinking on, among the Palestinians. There, there is no doubt about that. And that leads to Palestinians reacting to something like this in a very different way than maybe would be productive right so they see Hamas doing this and they say okay yeah I don't like Hamas ki killing uh, civilians but then again they kind of Israel kind of deserves it for all the pain that they inflicted on all of us and now if they lash back in this kind of way like we've seen over the past week then they even more deserve it right which is exactly why why Israeli military the Israeli military response is so counterproductive because it kind of emphasizes exactly all the negative and dark thoughts that Palestinians already harbor about Israel. It, it, it would be a completely different story if Israel sh showed another side. If Israel said, horrible pain has been inflicted on us by Hamas, 1,400 people have died because of Hamas, and we're going to show our peaceful side. We're going to show that we're the good guys, and we're going to talk, as you as you argued last week, we're going to talk to the Palestinians and see how this could have happened and how we can work together towards a better tomorrow. That would create a very different picture towards your average Palestinian who has no specific sympathy towards Hamas. And, and also everyone else who is, who is supporting the Palestinian cause. Um, and I think you could see this over the last week. You could see this very well where there was a lot of shock for three days right so it happened on saturday i think we were very shocked on on sunday when we recorded the last episode 
then Monday, you could because more and more of the terrible images were coming out, more and more details became became evident. And then suddenly, after these you know three days of shock, you could see opposition yeah, groups or basically anyone who who holds it with the Palestinians in this case rise up and, and basically say, well, you know, uh, the Palestinians kind of have the right to do this because of because of X. And I think that it's not only the Palestinians who feel this way, um, but it's also an extended, well, extended obviously to the Arab world uh, who feels this way. But then also, I'm pretty sure to a lot of people in the West who will have sympathy for the Palestinian cause and then are part of this group. Moving on to the third group, and I think you can partly count us to this group but not really there you have the peacemakers right the ones who are calling for peace um, or for decrease in humanitarian suffering i think we, we can support that but then this always moves on uh, into people calling for peace conferences and peace talks and let's let's sit all around table and sing kumbaya and this is something that may have been very useful in the 1960s, uh, not so much the singing Kumbaya, but certainly peace talks, because there was still, for example, a real possibility of a two-state solution. Uh, not that it was easy, because it always got back to uh, the future of Jerusalem and the right of return of the millions of displaced Palestinians. So it, it's something that was tried a few times, including with the Camp David Accords of the, the second Camp David rounds of the 1990s. But... In the 1960s, there was still a Palestine that could somehow theoretically co coexist with Israel territorially, with the Palestinian state, and somehow finding a future for the Palestinians, despite, if you like, the, the hardship that was brought on, on, on millions of Palestinians uh, because of the creation of Israel. However, peace talks now in 2023 are complete nonsense and it might seem like a uh, reasonable thing to say because everyone likes the word peace right it, it sounds great like oh yeah the, the, these are the moderates the moderates are saying um let's 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 talk about peace let's have some big conference where the palestinians and israelis come together but it only once again reinforces the false narrative that there are still palestinians <laughs> to negotiate peace with and there aren't millions of palestinians exist but they no longer have anything to negotiate because they've lost this conflict. So who would be willing to have peace talks? The moderate Israelis. The moderate Israelis who feel that maybe Netanyahu is going a little bit too far and who think, hey, you know what? We should surely find a way to coexist in the 21st century without all this violence. Yeah, except that who are you going to talk to? Based on what? What are you going to offer the Palestinians? Are you going to withdraw the, th the 30 years of settlement policy since the 1980s? Are you going to withdraw the... Uh, the control over Gaza Strip and West Bank? Are you actually going to renegotiate the future of Jerusalem? No, the, of course the answer is no. Israel has no need to do that because they've won the conflict and there is no peace talks to be had and it's very dangerous to suggest that there is. And there's also, and this comes from right from my own experience uh, during my exchange, well, online COVID exchange in Israel, uh, but from, from the friends I've made there, these moderate Israelis who 100% exist, but they, I, I'm not sure how open they are for peace talks right now. Um, and and this, this is based off some personal conversations I had with some friends, so this is anecdotal, right? By no, by no means representative. However, these are some very, you know, calm-minded people who will usually always criticize, in particular, the Netanyahu government for everything. But I've heard things from them in the past days that you that you can clearly trace back to the horror that they've experienced. To the extreme horrors of these uh, you know, 72, maybe 90 hours where there were still militants within the country and all of these images came out. And right, this is one of these aspects of the Western bubble, right? Instead of calling for a 10 day, uh, what, what we already um, said in last week's ep episode, instead of calling for a 10 day, you know, d yeah, period of mourning, um, even the moderate voices within Israel, at least the ones I've talked to, are very much out for revenge and that's a, that's a very dangerous setting and then into the setting and let's take this now away from these three groups and from the western bubble for a moment and let's look at the international relations perspective 
you can clearly see what's what's happening and uh, on both sides and that's not good is that israel israel is preparing this ground offensive into gaza they've issued this uh, well I, i think they've prolonged it now a few times um but they've issued this uh, this warning to civilians in gaza to to move south right in a incredibly small territory they told a million people hey move 20 kilometers south uh, we are going to come in with uh, with the military um so you have this ground offensive coming in and then at the same time from the hamas side you have them use uh, like preventing civilians from leaving and using them as human as human shields and calling for a day for a day of anger uh and danger uh, out in the world right so both sides are not doing what could be productive but both sides are very much on a course of escalation yeah and none of this leads to to put in a cliched way a better tomorrow right and uh, not for the israelis and not for the palestinians i i actually had a number of students uh last week in class who said something along the lines of well this is the only way for hamas or for the palestinians to strike back they to fight back because they don't have any other options anymore once again i want to remind people there's no fighting back the conflict is done in that sense from a palestinian perspective but you have to ask yourself what does it mean to fight back if there's no constructive outcome to that fight right So if you were to look at for example the French resistance during the Second World War you can argue okay the French resistance did a few dodgy things they also killed some civilians but they had they knew what success looked like they wanted to make it difficult for the German war machine to continue occupying Vichy France while the allied forces from the United States and the UK and the Soviet Union were fighting the Nazis and so they wanted to contribute to a future where the Nazis could be defeated and that from that perspective made sense it's not pretty to kill civilians but you could argue that there is a um uh and justifying the means kind of narrative in the french resistance during the second world war but for hamas or for any palestinian organization to be violently fighting back doesn't make any sense because there is no positive outcome for the Palestinians there there is no future scenario where the Palestinians will get back their land it's just not going to happen and i know that Palestinians listening to this might be i don't know if you throw tomatoes at your phone or whatever but might be very upset about me saying this but it is the sad reality that they're facing and there's nothing just about this there is nothing righteous about this there's nothing to celebrate about this but it is reality that that fight is lost and every time Hamas or any other organization engages in further in further violence it is simply an act of vengeance and it has nothing to do with quote fighting back and this very nicely leads to another aspect of the western bubble that we haven't talked about a lot in the past 60 episodes because they haven't i mean either they're not in power um i'm i'm talking about the the western left here or people who identify themselves as left of center or left wing uh, in that sense because we usually talk about um either the center right or the, the the right wing simply because those are the ones who are usually in power in charge um but i think here with with this topic you've seen again it took them 3 4 days to come out Uh, there was a lot of silence right there was only pro israeli voices within the west within the first 3 4 days and slowly but surely you could see you could see others um others coming out in particular here the western left because what you just described you know these students saying in class is something that is a popular claim out there um and there so, so there's two examples i would like to um i, w- I would like to to point out here so there was one uh one uh, here this one statement is from a harvard student organization um i should add that by now a lot of the groups who were associated to the statement have since basically said no thanks um we we no longer stand with the statement um and it reads we the undersigned student organizations hold the israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence end quote Right so so exactly exactly what what you just said what we said before that Israel is responsible for the attack of Hamas on them and the 1400 people dying and then the second quote uh, and this one is a bit longer it just comes from the George Washington University students for justice in Palestine and I quote decolonization is not a metaphor 
It is not an abstract theory to be discussed and debated in classrooms and papers. It is a tangible, material event in which the colonized rise up against the colonizer. We reject the distinction between civilian and militant. We reject the distinction between settler and soldier. Every Palestinian is a civilian, even if they hold arms. A settler is an aggressor, a soldier, and an occupier, even if they are lounging on our occupied beaches. End quote. Yeah, so with respect to that first quote, I mean, I, you always have to ask yourself, what, what should I care about who you hold responsible? What does that mean, holding responsible for all unfolding violence? Um, Israel has influence over the violence, not so much they didn't have influence on Saturday morning over what was going to happen. That was a decision by Hamas and there was nothing at that moment Israel could do. But you could look at the past 30, 40 years or 70 years and say, hey, you know what, if Israel had used different policies, maybe Hamas wouldn't even exist or Hamas would be more peaceful, maybe, possibly. So Israel has some influence. Uh, but at any given moment, anyone who pulls the trigger of a gun is the final person responsible for the violence. Anyone who sends a rocket into the air is the one responsible for pushing that button. That That is conflating the idea of responsibility with um, influencing dynamics or having some kind of impact on the behavior of others. Of course, Israel has, the, has impact on the behavior of Palestinians. Obviously, Israel is the powerful side in this violence more powerful than Hamas but any Hamas fighter militant who decides to kill an Israeli civilian is the one responsible for the violence and whether a student organization in the United States says that we hold Israel responsible for them well sorry I couldn't care less about who you hold responsible or not it's completely meaningless but but, but this is very telling of of this you know, of this mindset. And I mean, so this, this is coming from the left, right? And it is basically saying that Israel res is responsible here and therefore they could have avoided uh, the, well, the scenes that we are, well, not the scenes that we saw on Saturday, um, if they if they had behaved more more according to our liking. But the, the, the second quote is even more outrageous to me um, because, Right, it's it's one of these things of you know decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, yes, it's uh, you know it's a it is an it is a, a theory that um, we are, I mean we 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 have seen this, this particularly during during uh, the twentieth century during the processes of decolonization. But then to say that you know every Palestinian is a civilian, um, that I, that's simply not well. I mean. If you, if you want to see it from a Westphalian point of view, right, then that's that's accurate, right? Uh, they're not, not not a single Palestinian can be considered a Palestinian soldier, but I think you can very much differentiate between a civilian and a militant. Well, and also between a innocent person and a murderer, um, in the sense that if you uh, you know I, even the word militant is a little bit difficult, but if you're a Hamas fighter and you murder a civilian, then you're just a murderer. Um, if you are an Israeli soldier and you murder a Palestinian civilian, a Palestinian, you're also a murderer. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's sometimes we like to use simplistic terms to oversimplify uh, really complex dynamics. And for example, even this word of decolonization. Yes, decolonization was real in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Northern Africa, in other places, in, in, in uh, all around the world. Countries decolonized from European dominance. But very much like, for example, the comparison with apartheid, to apply something like decolonization or apartheid to the Palestinian experience and the violence between Israelis and Palestinians is to me just academically intellectually wrong because it's imprecise it suggests something that isn't real on top of that it is kind of offensive towards the palestinian experience because it sort of puts it into a simplistic narrative that isn't that has no bearing on their actual uh, lives and it suggests that this what is happening right now with hamas and the actions last week perpetrated by Hamas somehow are a step towards that, quote, decolonization. That somehow this is a legitimate fight to free Palestine, whatever that means. 
again, the conflict is over. There is no scenario in which this will lead to all of a sudden Israel withdrawing its settlers. There is no scenario in which this will lead to Israel saying, oh, you know what, we were wrong. In fact, this will only make it harder for the remaining Palestinians to just get on with their lives. Uh, so this whole narrative of this is a fight for freedom against the oppressor and if we just fight hard enough and kill enough Israelis then at some point Palestine will be free is simply false and people might believe in their little fairy tales but what I care about is the children on in Gaza Strip the children in the West Bank and the children in uh, Palestinian refugee camps actually having some kind of future and none of this discourse helps them it only harms them and this is the final aspect of the the bubble as uh, the bubble part i want to talk about here um is the illusion that your big statements and your social media posts and your you know student organization that there's any that, that, that will make any difference Right. Ach, I, 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 I have, you know, I've been stayed off of social media last week, right? I, I told the listeners that I made the mistake to go on social media Saturday morning when everything happened. I've since stayed off of social media largely because I couldn't take it anymore. Because every single little student and everyone who has a phone believed that they needed to create a pamphlet of some sort and, you know, call call on either side to to end violence and call the other side a terrible, terrible group. And uh, this is, uh, it's, it's just not helping, right? It's none of this is constructive. I'm glad that you are waving your Israeli flag. I'm glad that you're waving your Palestinian flag. And most likely you're going to start beating each other up on the street, as we have seen multiple times over the weekend in, in Europe. But you are, you are, you, if, if anything, I would say you're actually worsening the conflict because you're not allowing for an international climate of solutions, right? Solution-based approaches. You're only allowing, you're only leading to an international environment of, Let's let's all raise the stakes to an extent that nobody can overcome the stakes, the, you know, the, the stakes anymore. And, and this is a very common pattern that you see also with, for example, the invasion of Ukraine, which we've analyzed and over again. People like being part of this fight and feeling morally righteous, morally superior and knowing that they're fighting the good fight versus the evil fight uh, to the, to, towards the evildoers. Uh, the consequence of that is that the world is a much darker place. It, to be part of this movement against another group, to be rather than analyzing the situation, to become part of a war that is not even yours. You're not even Palestinian. You're not even Israeli. You're just someone in Spain or in Germany or in the United States. To be part of this internet hype on one side or the other side means that it's going to be even less likely for those Palestinian children in refugee camps to ever get out, to ever have a brighter tomorrow, right? So you feel good about yourself because you can look in the mirror and be very angry with Israel, or if you're on the other side, be very angry with the Palestinians or Hamas or whoever, and you don't contribute anything positive um, to any of this scenario. And and it's it's a human condition that wanting to be part of a militant tribe to be wanting to be part of an aggressive tribe i should also by the way point out that um the thing that i didn't really react to with this quote that you read uh, namely the 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 moral issue between we reject the distinction between civilian and militant and settler and soldier and that kind of thing is exactly what israel is also applying in some ways right and it's this idea from both sides that somehow, if you sympathize with the cause of the other side, if you're a Palestinian and you mildly understand or vaguely understand what Hamas is doing, then that essentially means that you're part of Hamas. Or if you are a Israeli and you sympathize with the settlers or you sympathize with the Israeli defense forces, then somehow you are the oppressor, you're the colonizer. And that's then by, as a consequence, leads to you deserving essentially the death penalty, right? So I had students in class actually arguing that Israeli citizens who were killed, civilians who were killed by Hamas, kind of deserved it because they were part of the Israeli state. Think about that for a second. Someone who hasn't 
hurt any other other person who maybe feels proud to be Israel, who feels that Israel is on the right side of the conflict, but hasn't actually committed any violent act, deserves to die because they sympathize with your enemy. And on the other side, if you're Palestinian and you sympathize with Hamas, you deserve to die because now you have become a terrorist. That kind of thinking is not just morally repulsive, I would argue, but it's also just intellectually insane. It, it actually doesn't provide any understanding of these dynamics, because according to that uh, theory, then I, as a Dutch person, deserve death because my government was responsible for killing civilians in Iraq. Or if you're, the, if you're a U.S. citizen, you deserve... Uh, you deserve death because your government was responsible for um, civilian casualties in Afghanistan or in Vietnam or wherever else. And can you explain to our listeners what is the problem? The result of this is something incredibly damaging. And that's humanitarian suffering, right? It increases humanitarian suffering. Because not only, as I, as I laid out uh, before, right, does this create an international climate where I don't think anything is going to be achieved. Um, so the situation on the ground is not improving um, by no means. Um, but also the situation, you know, within classrooms, the situation of protests, uh, none of this is, is improving. I mean, I, I cannot imagine sitting in a classroom where someone calls for or where someone says this person deserved to die. Uh, it's 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 uh, yeah i don't think that this is uh you know and this is making me upset again right this this topic is is a very emotional one uh on on all sides and i have and this is something again from you know personal conversations uh, of the past week i don't think i've ever had a topic uh you know hit the world like this um I, except with covid right but covid was more like a collective suffering where I've encountered so many people who are genuinely suffering from the current climate, right, we're in, where, I don't know, either they come out of a conversation with friends and, and they just say, I can't anymore, this is terrible, I don't know what this is, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if we're still friends, and other people who just, I don't know, they, they've seen too many images or they've had to think about all the humanitarian suffering that we're going through right now. I, the, this conflict is, is getting very close to people. And I think... One of the reasons for that is the longevity of the conflict and that we all somehow have are connected to it. As we explained last week, we as Western Europeans, for very understandable and I would argue even reasonable um, uh, factors, are have a bias in favor of Israel um, because of our our memories and our fear of anti-Semitism, our memories of the Holocaust, our memories of a thousand year of a thousand years of oppression of Jewish people in Europe. Um, we, we, we have a special place in our heart, if you like, for Israel and the Jewish people because of our own society's behavior. And that that lingers on. But I think there's two other aspects that maybe deserve to be highlighted here and that distinguish it from certainly the first one distinguishes it from COVID, namely that this conflict kind of shows the worst of humanity, right? You can have a really, a very reasonable Israeli or a very reasonable Palestinian, lovely people, amazing people. And when it goes to this conflict, they essentially turn into monsters. The fact that I had students who suggested that Israeli citizens deserve to die because they were part of the Israeli state means that they have for, forgotten all of their basic human values at that moment, at, in that conversation. If you have Israelis who say, I don't care about uh, Palestinians right now suffering because uh, they are harboring Hamas terrorists, those Israelis at that moment have forgotten what it means to be human, what it means to be generous and kind and understanding and try and, and what, it, what you have to do to be, be a reasonable member of civil society, right? The, in many ways, this conflict shows the real darkness that human beings can fall into when the conditions allow for that to happen. And, and that, that stresses all of us out. And the, the last thing, which kind of connects to COVID a little bit, but is something that your generation suffers more from much more than my generation, is 
the ridiculous amount of imagery that comes at you, right? So I have read about the violence. I have read about bodies being dragged through the street. I have read about torture. I know that it existed, but I haven't seen any images. I haven't seen any videos and I didn't need to. I don't need to see those images to understand what is happening. But your generation gets 24 seven bombarded with those images. And then if you're already on one side, then all you get is an entrenchment of your echo chamber, of your um, bunker mentality. And every image, if you're on the pro-Palestinian side, whatever that means, uh, then every image of the Israeli military bombing Gaza will entrench you further into your anger. If you are on the pro-Israeli side, every image of a kidnapped person being murdered by Hamas will entrench you further into your perspective and you will not get out of it anymore. So we can see the, the huge damage that social media and the internet and this continuous flow of information does to our brain. Right in here, I'm very grateful for, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I'm grateful for the for something a European technocrat has done. But um, we, we have seen the European Union uh, writing very strong worded letters to Twitter or X <laughs> and, and TikTok about getting this under control. Because this is, I mean, and, and, and obviously both sides are using this, right? And there have been allegations on both sides of staging certain, certain parts and certain images. But for me, um, one of the, and luckily I was quick enough to, sw to, to basically swipe away, was, you know, just me going on, on Twitter and suddenly the, the Israeli embassy of Germany um, posted and basically, you know, wrote, oh, you know, because there have been allegations that, the, that, that uh, these events didn't happen, suddenly, you know, there are videos of, 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 of people burned, right? And, and I mean, so obviously both sides are using this because it will further their own cause. But I, I very much agree with that take that, the excess images, you know, we see that they will very much affect us. Um, and I think that uh, the, especially that point on, on the entrenchment, uh, that that works as well, right? And then uh, ultimately, yeah, I, I, the problem is that, or I mean, I hope this is a good thing, is that I can understand that these people the, that you described earlier, right, the perfectly reasonable Israeli and the perfectly reasonable uh, Palestinian, that they both forget their humanity for, for a moment. I think that's a very human thing to do in that sense. And I hope that the listeners of the po this podcast, you know, that they know and, and understand this, that they, it, it doesn't make them bad people uh, or it makes them human. No, no, of course, it's got nothing to do with bad people or not. Really good people can do horrible things. We've, we've seen that throughout history. I think the question to ask in these kinds of conversations with whoever you're talking to and whichever side you're talking to is, okay, so what is success to you? And what what is it that you think this is going to accomplish? So if someone somehow shows any sympathy for the Hamas attacks, ask them, what do you think the outcome is? What will be accomplished with these Hamas attacks. And then when someone says, well, this is the only way for the Palestinians to fight back, your question has to be, fight back towards what? What is going to be the outcome of this fight? And there you will notice that in the end, the only answer people will be able to give is actually just vengeance. Um, you know, the Hamas is achieving vengeance, if that is, you know, if you think that's an achievement, by murdering Israelis because they feel too many Palestinians have been murdered in the past. And Israel right now and the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, Israeli military, are achieving vengeance on the Palestinians, collective punishment, collective vengeance on the Palestinians for harboring Hamas and for sort of sympathizing with Hamas. But uh, Israel is not going to be any safer because of it, and the Palestinians are not going to be any better off without it. And once you get to that stage of the conversation, reasonable people will probably start scratching their head and say, hang on, do I actually care about vengeance? Is vengeance important to me? Or is it important to me that that Palestinian child in a refugee camp has a better tomorrow? What do I care about? And that might be a way for them to come back to humanity, right? Right. And, and this is one of the, one of the, I think, or the central damage uh, that we can identify here is that the current... Israeli behavior, right? The behavior of the Israeli government 
is not making Israelis safer um, in Israel and not in the world, right? Because as as of as of a result of the airstrikes, Hamas called on the called basically for the day of anger, where it, I think in France alone there were 43 bomb threats uh, to different sites. Um, I know that in all of Europe, uh, security measures in in and around uh, Jewish institutions, or whether it's a synagogue or um, a school, have been uh, have been increased. It's not making it's not making Israelis safer, and on the other hand, uh, Hamas actions are also, as you just said, they're, they're not right. What success? They're they're not uh, they're, they're not bringing any of this back. Yeah. So any self notion or any any idea that people seem to imply when they speak about this of it being a way for Israel to defend itself or to achieve security is simply false once again because it doesn't achieve security it doesn't defend the israeli citizen it in fact makes things way worse so these people need to ask themselves my words when i say israeli democracy has a right to defend themselves what am i actually saying because how is this providing further security to israel anyone else answer it is not once again the final result of that is the word vengeance and is that what you really want um, let's take this to the Western bubble damage, right? The specific damage that the Western bubble does in this in this uh, this moment, and here we see a West, right? That's very much because of its past history and culture, very much you know on the supporting side of Israel right now. But you can also see a West exposed in their unwillingness, or others might say inability, to look and find. We have well to look for and find real solutions um, that could that could solve any of this. Yes, and I don't know if we are already thinking about the future at this stage of the conversation, but um, the real solutions have to start with those hard truths that we mentioned before, right? The hard truths that the the existential conflict is over. We need a solution. So when people are still trying to say, "I'm trying to." I'm looking for a solution between the Palestinian people and Israel. Well, you can look as much as you like. You're not going to find it because the solution has already arrived. Namely, there's one winner and one loser, period. The solution of that the West could add to, where the West could add value, as in supporting the losers of this conflict in uh, finding a better tomorrow, is something that actually costs a lot of money and costs a lot of empathy and sympathy. And that is something that the West is not willing to pay. The, the West is not willing to put their money where their mouth is, right? So they may pay lip service to the hardship of the Palestinians, but they're not willing to say, okay, we're actually going to take responsibility for the refugee camps. We're actually going to see if how many Palestinian displaced people are willing to settle in Minnesota or in Andalusia or in Kent or in... Um, uh, Berlin or anywhere else, there is no real search for solutions because people in the West are still stuck in this idea that there is this fight between Israel and the Palestinians and that a peace conference will be the only way out. Well, before we move on to, to the future, um, there's one more damaging aspect um, I want to discuss, and that is We've seen over the past week uh, more and more pro-Palestine, again, whatever that means, protests uh, erupt all over, all of Europe, all in the West. And again, so here comes my bias in a little bit, right? I've said this in the last episode that for me as a German, it's, uh, it's right, a anything that damages anything Jewish or Israeli is always difficult to observe. And for me, it's difficult to keep a calm head. And then it becomes more difficult to do so when you see only I don't know only five kilometers away from here, uh, you 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 see images of uh, pro-Palestine celebrations of the of the massacre in Israel, right? Um, however, my personal discomfort with this and the German society's discomfort with this shouldn't turn into something damaging, and that would be banning protests, because this is what you see all over Europe, right? That protests are being banned in in, in yeah, in, in, in this in this moment. Yeah, and I, I had an interaction with the student um, last week about, so I, I said something like, I also found it difficult to see people celebrating the actions by Hamas. 
and then someone said they weren't celebrating they were simply protesting but you can that's 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 those two concepts merged into one certainly early in the week right uh, on monday and tuesday last week it wasn't clear whether people were actually protesting in the sense of saying hey just remember the palestinians and don't let israel all of a sudden commit horrible crimes against the palestinian people or were they actually kind of happy uh, uh, to see finally from their perspective some some vengeance um palestinian striking back somehow there were certainly elements of celebration in those protests and that is very unpleasant to see i don't see how you could ever feel any happiness seeing people get killed what i whoever those people are right once again we're going back to what is your humanity and what is your starting principle however exactly as you said um the whole point of people protesting is that they should be allowed to say things that we find disagreeable that we find uncomfortable otherwise if the only moment to protest is when society agrees with you there's no point to protesting right protests are a statement against the majority of society against the government protests are a way of saying i don't like what my society what my country what my state is doing so regardless of whether the germans feel uncomfortable with seeing palestinian flags being waved or not whether regardless of whether i feel uncomfortable with celebrations of the murder of civilians that is the whole point of protesting and a free society and to ban that to ban those kinds of protests to ban those kinds of celebrations means that we are no longer in touch what makes society free that it, it goes completely against the principles of free and open democracy the thing that people like to emphasize so much with respect to israel we should probably look at our own democracy here you want democracy that means that people are going to say things in the streets that you find unpleasant well deal with it that's the price of freedom right and what now and now that we are talking about uh, the future i i don't think it's it's i don't think it's a, yeah i don't think we should be the ones to say you know what in this one hour podcast we'll give you the solution um, despite the fact that I, you know, I, I think there is a an extra episode coming up in where in which we are going to discuss um, what could this look like. Um, but this is definitely uh, not not, uh, not coming to the part here. But this is the this is the question, right? And also a question you've you've received a lot of from students. Um, what can be done to solve this? And I think the the short answer here is um, what we've said in in the beginning of this of this episode is that. We simply have to well, well, realize reality the way it is and no longer hang on to this vision of, you know, this 70-year-old conflict uh, going on. Yeah, so without having all those answers, at least it would be a huge step forward from a practical human well-being perspective to say, I'm not going to look for a solution but for the 1950s conflict between Palestine and Israel, I'm going to look for a solution for the Palestinians in 2023, as in the Palestinians who are suffering in 2023, who are suffering in large part because of horrific policies by the Israeli state. Absolutely. But it is just a fact that it happened. We can't turn back time. I think the international community has a lot of thinking to do about what their role has been in this the israeli state has a lot of thinking to do but all of that is an issue of self-reflection what we now need from a practical perspective is in 2023 how can the world and israel and the palestinian authority bring well-being to the palestinians who have lost this existential conflict and again palestinians want like thinking about this because it means that you finally have to accept that the conflict is over and done with. The Israelis don't like thinking about it because all of a sudden it puts a huge burden on their shoulder. And the West and the rest of the world doesn't like thinking about it because it will inevitably lead to saying, how can we financially and otherwise help the millions of affected Palestinian victims? And that is something that is way less pleasant for a politician in the UK or the Netherlands or Germany or Spain than to say, oh, we stand by Israel and we just want peace for the whole region. You know, that's easy, cheap talk. To actually put billions on the table to support millions of Palestinians 
is a completely different story. But that is the direction that we need to look into. And I wish that more people would talk about that rather than this everlasting entrenchment as if we are living in 1955. In line with this is the teaser I just gave for a future extra episode, right? It's not only what can the West do, but I think it's also a question of what can the Arab states do. Uh, but as I said, this is for um, a future episode. I The last point I have for what is the future is a very cynical one. So I apologize for this in advance. But um, the question is, uh, when will we no longer care about this? To the extent where it's no longer at the, you know, at the front and cover of all of all the newspapers. Um, because something that I've realized uh, now um, with, you know, with this Israel and Hamas conflict is the fact that Ukraine, um, has disappeared a little bit from the public discussion. Um, and also Ukraine has disappeared uh, from uh, from a newspaper. And here I'm not saying, you know, every single article has disappeared, but uh, as, as you, as the listeners know, right, every newspaper has the different, uh, the different, you know, menu options on the website. And my newspaper always, always had, you know, a start a homepage, then politics, economy, finance, uh, culture, and so on. Um, but since the Russian invasion, they also had one of those uh, menu icons for Ukraine. And that has silently uh, disappeared, um, just as uh, the listeners know I live in Berlin. And all these Berlin museums, they always had Ukrainian flags uh, flying out, you know, to show solidarity. And I always asked myself, well, what's their exit scenario, right? Are they going to wait until Ukraine wins this war? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to break it to them, but I'm not sure if, whether that's happening. They've now been replaced with, uh, with, with sometimes with uh, Israeli flags. So here, um, my question and very cynical question for the future would be, um, when, when will we stop uh, thinking about this one on a daily basis? Well, and the question, uh, the, the answer to the question is essentially when the next hype strikes, right? Uh, or when time at some point just makes us bored with this situation. This is what is another fragile aspect of our human existence, of our human condition, is that we overvalue, we overemphasize the dramatic and the hype invasion of Ukraine, 1,400 Israelis killed by Hamas, and we undervalue the small incremental change that actually drives the world, right? These dramatic moments are typically a function, are an outcome of incremental small change, but we're not interested in incremental small change. We're not interested in one settlement in the West Bank, because that's, you know, doesn't seem like big news. We're not interested in one Palestinian being murdered, even though this happens all the time. Uh, we're not being, we're not interested in one anti-Semitic remark, because, you know, it's just one remark. And as a result, we, our brain goes from one dramatic moment, one hype to the next dramatic moment. And that makes it harder for us to connect to reality where the most important powerful forces in the world are exactly that one anti-Semitic comment, that one Palestinian being killed in the West Bank or that one settlement being built or those items, those small little steps towards a specific future are the ones that we should care about, but we don't. We care about the dramatic and in the age of social media, this is even worse than before because it allows us to be outraged at that at, at a specific moment. It allows us to simplify the world into good versus evil rather than seeing the world for what it is. A very complex system of infinite, small, incremental little steps towards a better or worse tomorrow. This seems like a moment to end today's conversation on the Israel and Hamas conflict. If you have any questions, comments or regards, make sure to send us an email to thewesternbubble at gmail.com and we will try to incorporate them in our following episodes. Thank you very much to the listeners for joining us today. Make sure to join us again next week when we burst the Western bubble. That is it from my side. Balder, which closing quote did you pick for us today? Last week I quoted a 20th century hero Martin Luther King. And today I'm going to quote another 20th century hero, Nelson Mandela, who said, If you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. Then he becomes your partner. <laughs>